Hello, Scaling Up Nation. Trace Blackmore here, your host for Scaling Up H2O, the podcast where we're scaling up on knowledge so we don't scale up our systems. And Nation, I have heard you. You all have questions about filming amine products. Some of us use them in boilers. Some of us use them in closed loop systems. Some of us are using them in cooling towers. Well, what do we need to know about using filming amine? products, what do we need to know about the systems and the products themselves? I've heard all types of questions, and there's one thing for sure, you can turn to Scaling Up H2O so you can get this valuable information in a format that you can use when you need it. That's, of course, when you are driving to and from accounts. So, folks, we are going to do that today. Before we get started, though, I do want to let you know about a tool that I use, and I know you've heard about it before, but it is Audible. Folks, we are in our cars so many times throughout the day. We spend so much time in front of our windshield that we simply don't have time to read as much as we want to read. Well, folks, Audible is the perfect solution for that. And if you go to scalinguph2o.com forward slash Audible, I'll get you a free book and a free month. You can try Audible and you can see why I think it's one of the best tools that I have in my car when I'm driving to and from accounts. Well, folks, again, today we are talking about filming amines. Now, we are going to have a lot of information. This is going to be a show that you're going to want to listen to several times. I know several of you out there in the Scaling Up Nation say that you like listening to these shows several times. You can get all the information. I have no doubt that this is going to be one of these shows. So I hope you enjoy my interview with filming amine expert, Meredy Kabari of WST. My lab partner today is Meredy Kabari of WST. Meredy, how the heck are you today? <laughs> I'm doing well, thank you, how are you? I'm doing superbly well, thank you so much for asking. Meredy, I think you and I met about two, three years ago, is that about right? I think so, yeah, I think that, yes, let's go with that. Yeah. Okay. We'll just go with that. That's what it was. I believe it was out of technical training for the Association of Water Technologies. And I got to tell you, I love the way that you just get straight down to the matter and you tell it like it is. You had no problem doing that with me during my calculations class, how you ask questions, and even gave me some criticisms that I've, uh, I've changed some of my slides for. I have no doubt that you're going to use that to help everybody out there in the Scaling Up Nation understand filming a means better. Uh, well, hopefully, hopefully that's how everybody else walks away from my <laughs> engaging. <laughs> I'm sure everybody will love it. And, you know, talk about filming the means there's so you ask a water treater about filming the means you ask 10 water treaters, you're going to get 10 different answers. There's so much competing information out there about filming the means. I thought bringing somebody like yourself, who's an expert on that subject, to answer some of those questions and clarify what us water treatment folk need to know about filming the means so we can apply it properly. That's a show that's long overdue. So thank you so much for coming on and helping us do that. Absolutely. Sure. Do you mind letting the Scaling Up Nation know a little bit about yourself before we get started? Um, sure. So I am a mom and a wife out of Denver, Colorado. I have a degree in biochemistry. That's what I studied at school. I spent the first, gosh, five, six years of my career um, as a bench chemist in oil and gas, doing or developing fluid systems, dealing with topside and downhole microbial issues, um, really no different than we do in water treatment, and um, working with colloidal particle dispersions. Um, so super nerdy way of saying, um, how do we get more oil and or more gas out of the ground? And then I joined the WST team initially in oil and gas. And I think my joining WST crashed the oil and gas market. <laughs> we killed it for a year and then I killed the market. <laughs> um, but 
that's okay. Because what it allowed me to do, uh, my bosses came to me and asked me if I would join the water treatment team. They very lovingly said, um, we have nothing for you to do in oil and gas. How do you feel about water treatment? And I said, well, I know a lot about water. I don't know, you know, the ins and outs of this particular industry, but um, thank you very much for my job. Thank you for not just letting me go. And sure, I'll do whatever you want. So basically, they came to me and they said, there's this filming and technology that we have, and we need you to learn absolutely everything you can. And we're going to put you on a team with a sales guy. And we want you to, to go out and, and educate the community and sell it. And so I basically spent about a year, honestly, just doing nothing but being the WST filming a mean librarian, where anything I could get my hands on to read anybody that had had experience that I could speak with, that's all I did. And then it allowed us to come out basically the other side of that with a decent, what I would consider theoretical understanding of the application of filming means where they've been used, how they've been used, why they've been used, how they've changed over time and then come forth to the U.S. market and and bring them, make it available to us um, here in the United States. So um, that's kind of my background and all of that. Um, I guess, does that, you want to know anything else? I'm an Aries. Does that matter? I think that does matter. The entire Stand Up Nation was wondering what your sign was. <laughs> April, baby. <laughs> well, there you go. Meredy, you were in the audience when I did my presentation in the 2018 AWT convention and expo. And I think you saw there was a lot of confusion about really what filming means were, how to test for it. You actually got up and helped explain how uh, I went about my process for testing. So there's so many questions about filming means it's almost hard to figure out where to start. So I want to start at the beginning because I can figure that that's the best place for it. So what is a filming amine? So do you want the super nerdy answer? Well, of course. And then, and then we can lighten it out from there. Okay. So super nerdy answer. Um, a filming amine is an organic molecule. So we have organic and inorganic chemistry. Organic chemistry, specifically speaking, is carbon chemistry, right? So it's, it's a molecule with a big fatty tail. So basically a big carbon chain that looks like a big long tail. And then an amine molecule, an amine itself is a, an organic chemistry we call it a functional group, okay? A functional group is just a molecule that can perform a specific function. So an amine is a functional group, carboxyl groups, um, or captains. There's all different types of functional groups. So a filming amine specifically is a molecule that's got a big carbon tail and then an amine head. And why that matters is that that, that big chain, that big tail, is what we call hydrophobic. They don't like water, okay? And then the amine heads um, are what we would call hydrophilic. They do like water. So it helps that molecule go into a solution, if you will. So each side of the molecule, whether you're talking about the tail or the head, can perform a specific function. A filming amine is it's a name that we gave a specific set of molecules based on a function. Okay, so it's, it's nomenclature based on something that it's capable of doing. In this case, filming. Lots of things form films, right? Glycols can form a type of film. Um, BZT is, is actually a filming amine type chemistry. There's amine functional groups on there. It just doesn't have the same type of tail as when we refer to filming amine chemistry. You also hear them called polyamines. A polyamine is, is a name or a nomenclature based on a structure, right? So poly, if you remember back to grade school, when you were learning all about root prefixes and suffixes and, um, Latin, Latin terms, right? Poly means many. So it just means many amines. So a polyamine could mean that you have one amine group on that tail. It could mean that you have two amine groups on that tail, right? A diamine or a triamine, mono di tri. So it's, it's, it's all nomenclature based on either function or structure. And ultimately, filming amines or polyamines, whatever you want to call them, fatty acid amines, they fall into a category of in, within organic chemistry of organic surfactants. That's ultimately you can you can say there's so many different ways to to say what they are, 
but you have to break down the word to fully understand what a writer or an author is trying to communicate about a specific structure. Does that make sense? I think it does. So as us water treatment folk use those terms interchangeably, is that okay? Well, it is to a degree. Like I said, polyamine means many. So if you have octadecilamine or ODA, which is a molecule that we're all very, very familiar with, that's actually a monoamine. (laughs) So technically speaking, categorically, I mean, that nomenclature doesn't exactly fit. But what we've done jargon-wise as a community is accept the word polyamine or the word filmiamine to be kind of this all-encompassing piece. There's actually a lot of different types of filmiamines out there. There's a lot of different molecules that have been created and that can serve this same filming function. So I think to use it as a blanket statement is, is fine because it's a word that we've all accepted as appropriate. But if you get super nerdy, like yours truly, and you want to get down to the ins and outs and whys, um, and you speak to some organic chemist along the way, um, they might pick at you. So everybody has been so warned and armed with the right terminology. Well, thank you for that definition. I know that helps. You know, we're talking a lot about amines today, but is this a new technology? So filming amines actually came about really in, in the 1960s, like mid 1960s. And honestly, I don't know the, the initial application of them or who got, you know, a spark of an idea in their brain and thought, oh, I know we could do this. What I do know, if we look through the history of them, is that about 1965, they kind of came on the scene. Um, and to be perfectly honest, they were a bit of a logistical nightmare. Filming a means in their raw material form Um, because remember how I said they were organic surfactants, they actually come as an organic surfactant. So it's like a waxy block, right? And how they were applied, because there was really no other understanding of how to apply them at that point, was they that that block was just dropped into water. And then you were at the mercy of, you know, rate of diffusion, temperature, agitation, and, and that really determined how the chemistry ended up really ultimately being applied, right? You were you were at the mercy of all of these physical characteristics. And what they found was that, yeah, it could be a real problem applying it that way. You could get a lot of gunking. You could get no movement, right? If you if you didn't really have a great rate of diffusion, if, if you didn't have a decent amount of flow, if, if there wasn't enough agitation on that surfactant brick, then nothing got released. Um, or maybe you had way too much movement way too fast. Right. And then you ended up with kind of a slime scenario. What they realized, though, is that for whatever reason, even though at the time they didn't really understand the rhyme or reason for how it was functioning, is that when it worked, it it worked like nothing else did. So basically, a, a team of chemists, team of scientists said, OK, well, let's really look at this then. let's figure out how to make this more functional, because there is potential for the chemistry here. We just have to figure out how to make it more user-friendly, right? So fast forward to, I don't know, early, maybe mid seventies, and they had really started to address the solubility issue. Rather than applying it in brick form, um, they figure out how to get the chemistry into solution. Fast forward a little bit more, and we figured out how to not only get it into solution, but then how to apply it. And really by, by 2000s, I mean, patents had come out, well, really late 80s, early 90s, you really saw all of that start to to really surface, not just in formulation, but in application. And then fast forward a little bit more, we figured out how to test it. And I think the biggest advancement, the biggest biggest thing that we've learned to date um, is that the chemistry, no different, honestly, no different than any other type of chemistry, the chemistry can work. The challenging piece in applying any type of chemistry, filming means included, is, are, is actually the mechanical components of what type of system we're going into. 
Meredith, that was a great history lesson on how a means came to where we are today. And I couldn't help but thinking when I was working with my father and he would use octadecilamine or ODA in uh, boilers and he loved it and he hated it. And one of the reasons that he hated it, he would call them gumballs. Sometimes he would call them snot balls that he would, they would start to build on themselves and they would clog areas. When he didn't have that problem, it treated the lines that he was having issues with better than anything else. But a lot of people are still thinking those are the amines that we're talking about right now. Can you speak on that? Sure. So I think really it's, it's kind of twofold. Um, the first thing is, is that, I mean, it is possible to overfeed something. It's possible to overfeed any chemistry, right? And the reality of the situation is um, the, the molecule that we're dealing with can form a fisheye, right? It can. The flip side of that is exactly what your dad was saying in that when you, when you dosed it properly, you didn't have that, that sort of issue. The original molecule, the original gangster, if you will, is ODA, is octadecilamine. That's what everyone's familiar with. And honest to God, it's just because it was the first one on the scene. So it's what people have the most experience with, is what people have heard about for the longest periods of time. However, the molecules that we deal with today, um, there's, there's so many different filming amines out there. Um, some of them, like we said, monoamines, diamines, triamines, there's tallows, there's ethoxylate. I mean, you could you can do so many different things to these molecules. Um, and we really work with cocktails of them. The, the kicker is, and the reason I think we continue to hear about ODA, one is because people have knee-jerk PTSD res type responses from when they had a bad experience. And that's understandable. The other piece of that is that ODA is the only filmer on um, on the CFR, whatever it, 173, what's the good number? I never remember the number, for use in application in for FDA. And so if you're in an FDA facility, whether it's a hospital or a food facility or something like that, where you have to conform to a regulation and you want to use filming technology, that's your only option. What we do know, though, is that the formulations that everyone was dealing with initially are not the formulations that use ODA today. So if the concern is, oh my gosh, this happened with ODA before, this will happen with ODA again, I can't say beyond a shadow of a doubt that you may not see movement of, you know, if you overfeed a situation that there couldn't potentially be an issue. I don't have a crystal ball, that's not possible. But what I can tell you is the formulations that were originally developed are different than the formulations with that molecule that we use today. It's much easier to work with. We, we worked out a lot of the kinks. I will tell you from my personal experience and some of the tests that I've done, I've tried to make it fail and we have had a lot of difficulty to duplicate anything like we would see with ODA. It hasn't happened once. Sure. Um, truly, the places in my experience where I've seen it be a challenge, we haven't had a fisheye type or what do you call them, gum falls? Sorry, I call them fish eyes type scenario. <laughs> but you can, with filming amines, you are going to remobilize metals. That's part of how they function. That's part of actually what's great about them. Um, but if you move, if you have a really heavily corroded environment and you move a lot of that really fast, it can get gunky, right? So knowing how to apply it and where to apply it and what to keep an eye on, and honestly, in the beginning, what to apply it potentially with to prevent that phenomenon so that you don't plug steam traps, so that you don't have some of those, you know, do a little preventative um, so you don't have some some of those issues. It's just it's all in, in understanding application. That's a great point. And as we talk today, we're going to talk about some of those things to make sure that we've got insurance so stuff like that wouldn't happen. And of course, when I was running my tests, we were doing what we knew to do to bring the system up to a point. And then we were like, okay, let's see now that everything's working. Let's see if we can get a failure within a controlled situation. So I'm not advising somebody just go out there and throw a five gallon drum into a system and see what happens. And we're going to talk about all the things that the Scaling Up Nation should be doing when they start up a new system as we continue our conversation. 
All right, Meredith, here is your opportunity. You get to nerd out again. My question for you is how does filming amine work? They basically function by, we talked about an amine being a functional group. Well, that amine head, whether there's one or up to three on the molecule, right? Each have little electron pairs. There's what we call a lone electron pair, which is just a really fancy way of saying a reactive area for a particular molecule, okay? And those little amines and that electron pair likes to react with metals. It doesn't really matter what metal, but there's just, it's, it's a charge type attraction in the simplest form of, of the explanation. And so the amines are attracted to the metals and they go to the metals, pump and they pop on, right? They adsorb onto the surface. And then what you end up with is all these little tails sticking out away from them. Whether it, you know, if you imagine a metal surface, you get all these little amines attached to the metal and then all of their little tails sticking up into the center. And I want you to think military type marching strategy. Okay. They, they're not just kind of this haphazard random, like one's here and one's there. And I don't know where the other ones are, but they line up, they line themselves up. There's this magical spacing that occurs between the molecules themselves, but you get them adsorbed onto the surface and then you get what we call an amine amine interaction. So you get an interaction between the functional groups themselves that helps organize them, structure them and give them specific spacing. And then all their little tails stick up into the middle. So what you've effectively done is no different than like paint. You've, you've coated the surface with them. The kicker is, and this is why this type of filming amines are different, why they work so effectively for corrosion inhibition, is that you've filmed them and then because all their little tails are sticking up into basically well, what we would call the, the water space, right? Um, all those little tails are hydrophobic. We talked about that in the beginning. They don't like water. So you basically have put down almost like an oily coating if you will, go into your kitchen, oil and water don't mix, right? So then what happens is the water and by virtue of that, anything in the water doesn't get to come in contact with the metal because you've just formed this hydrophobic barrier on the surface of the metal. So if the water can't come in contact with the surface and the ions in solution can't come in contact with the metal surface, then we greatly reduce corrosion rate and potential for deposition. Does that make sense? I think that makes a lot of sense. I really like the marching analogy that you said there. Now, I'm sure there's somebody out there that's saying, okay, well, if we're putting this film on there, is that going to affect the heat transfer of the system? Well, so yes, actually it is, but not in the way you're thinking, right? So people always think anything on the surface is going to induce some sort of insulation. And what filming amines do is, this is my way of phrasing this, they foster smooth, compact metal oxide layers. So we talked about how they form films and how that functions. And I'll, I'll answer, I'll come full circle in just a second, I promise. But the other thing that they do is they remove old, loose corrosion debris, right? So if you imagine a mountain range, right? So if you imagine your pipe looks like the Rockies, where I am, right? And there's just all of these peaks and valleys, and some of the mountains are taller than others, and, and you have to move heat from the core of the earth through all of those, you get varying rates of movement, right? But if I bring you out into the plains, where we just kind of have smoother, what, what I would consider more homogenous rolling hills, we don't have the same extreme changes in elevation, it's a lot easier to move heat from a core crust through those hills, right? The same thing holds true to a system that has been cleaned up and filmed over with filming amines. What filming amines can do and what, what we've seen them do is go through and remove old corrosion debris and they take in a pipe or on a tube or whatever, what looks like a mountain um, corrosion wise, and they smooth it out and they turn it into a uh, rolling prairie. <laughs> okay. And so what happens then is your heat transfer, it's easier 
to move through that smooth layer. So you actually see improved heat transfer with the application of filming amines. There was a gentleman out of Rostock, Germany at the university, and he looked at what's the difference in magnetite layer thickness if you use a conventional treatment program, like conventional phosphate program versus an amine program. And I want to say, I mean, you'd have to, you'd have to read all of his, you know, all of his work to fully understand the whole spectrum of what he was doing, but average thickness in a, um, of magnetite layer in a conventional program was like 15.6 micrometers. And the average thickness in a filmed environment was like five, gosh, five point something. I don't remember what the point was. I apologize. But so you're reducing magnetite thickness by a third and ergo Im- improving heat transfer. So does it have an impact on heat transfer? Yes. Is it in an insulated way like we would assume with other chemistries? No. And hopefully my explanation explains why. If not, I apologize if I confuse you. (laughs) No, I think you're doing a great job. You have a gift of analogy and you'll bring something that everybody can visualize into your explanation. I think you're doing a great job. Thank you. I usually get visual aids. I feel like (laughs) with visual aids, it's easier. You know, the podcast is a horrible visual platform. When I do certain shows, I'll be writing things down or I even do things on my whiteboard, which nobody can see, but it helps me <laughs> actually get through the podcast. Uh, hopefully the people out there listening can can uh, not only understand what you're saying, but also understand what I'm saying on those other podcasts. So, you know, filming a means came out originally with boilers and now we're hearing them treat pretty much every system that we come in contact with. So I thought we could explore that a little bit. You know, did it start in boilers and then we learned on boilers and now we can now we learn that we can treat other systems. What's going on with that and what systems is it suitable to be used in? Originally, when filming means were first used, again, it was a Hail Mary. It was either because there was going to be some sort of a shutdown and it was for an unknown period of time and, and they basically felt like, they had no other option or it was because something happened. There was some force majeure type of event. There was an earthquake. There was I don't know, something where basically it was, it was kind of their only option, but conventionally a mean chemistry was steam line chemistry, right? It was all about protecting a condensate line. And so in high pressure systems, they would basically in these, in these types of events, they'd be like, well, there's really no other option. Apparently we're trying this. And instinctively they would try apply to apply right before a steam line. And what they learned when it went well was that it worked and it worked like nothing else did. So what does that mean? That means that not only did they decrease the, the iron that was lost during whatever that time frame was. But it also meant that when they brought a system back online, that an iron throw did happen because expansion and contraction still exists, right? There's still, <laughs> physics is still involved. That the rate of recovery um, to what would be considered acceptable operating conditions, whether you're looking at that in water quality or you're looking at that in mils per year, pick your favorite marker for success. So the amount of iron that got thrown was substantially less. And so what they started doing was looking at, okay, so we know it works in condensate lines, right? It's it's a volatile chemistry. They can go into solution. They can go up into the steam. They can transfer through. What they started seeing was in systems with decent rates of return, at this point, specifically high pressure, high temperature systems, they would start seeing it come back around in the condensate return. And then systems from the point of condensate return up to a boiler and then in a boiler and then back out the line, they were noticing the same the same type of phenomenon through an entire system. And, and, and they really just, said, okay, it's an all volatile type treatment. So then the question became, how can we make it easier to apply this? Instead of going into a steam header or something like that, like we would conventionally do with a mean type chemistry, and honestly, some places still do, even with what I would consider modern filming technology products. Is there an easier way to do it? Is there a way that's more economical to do it? I mean, if there's a better way to build a widget, can we figure out a better way to build a widget? 
type of advancements, right? And what they learned was, okay, if we apply it in these other areas, one, it's, it's, it's easier. And two, we get the same type of functioning in the boiler, right? We get the same type of cleaning and filming and protection as we do in a steam line. We see the same type of thing then occur in a DA. We see the same type of phenomenon in a condensate return tank, in a makeup tank, in all of the different locations and on all of these different metallurgies. So I think then the question, you know, for the guys that were out there being innovative and trying to sell business was, okay, well, if it works here in relatively mixed metallurgy situations, why would it not work somewhere else? You know, we talk so much about magnetite. We talk so much about mild steel, but the reality of the situation is we see this type of filming phenomenon with all different types of metals. We see it on copper. We see it on aluminum. You know, we see it in all of the different areas. So why would it not function in those areas? And so I think people got innovative and were willing to try for lack of a better phrase, we're willing to, to give it a go. And what we found is we can do the same thing in cooling towers with filming means. We can do the same thing in closed loops with filming means. The filmers don't, they don't really care. <laughs> I, I say that in a cavalier manner, they really don't. Um, copper is copper and they're just going to film it. What we have seen as far as putting filming means in different types of systems is that cocktails are developed for specific types of systems. So for example, if you have a closed loop system that's primarily aluminum, aluminum likes a lower pH, right? It just does. And so in that cocktail, is there really a need for like an alkalizing amine, something to drive the pH up? And the easy answer is, well, no, probably not. In, in reality, maybe quite the contrary is that maybe a, a more suitable cocktail for aluminum-based systems is something that's um, got the filming amines in there, but is alkalizing amine free. In a cooling tower, is there ever a reason to put alkalizing amines in there? You know, probably not. In fact, we actually actively work to change the pH and bring it down a little bit, yes? So why would we put them in there? So I think the development has come for, for different cocktails, if you will, or different chemistries, different formulations for different types of systems was based on the needs of that type of system. I say that, um, but honestly, from a filming amine perspective, if you took a boiler product and you put it in a cooling tower, while I don't know that it would necessarily be the best suited, and one could argue that there's actually materials in that boiler product that would not be in the best interest of the cooling tower, the filmers would still perform the same. It might cause you other issues, but the filmers would still go in and film. Does that make sense? It makes perfect sense. And I know for a fact that there are people out there that have that very question. Hey, I'm using product X in my boiler. So I already have that in stock. Why don't I just put that in my cooling tower? Because I already own it. And they say that filming the means are good for cooling towers. So I think that was a great explanation. Um, yeah, I would talk to your vendor. If your vendor can answer those questions for you, then then either you need to do more digging or your vendor needs to do more digging. It's new technology to the United States, or it's relatively new, right? It's not new, but in the U.S., this phenomenon is new within our industry. And so everybody's still learning. Everybody's still working through things. It's a fair question to ask. Talk to your vendor. Fair enough. Now, you mentioned this is newer here in the States. But I know in Europe, they've been using it longer. Can you speak a little bit about that? Sure. It's really all over Russia, actually. The reality of the situation is they just were willing to look at the technology and, and developing the technology before we were. The way I like to think about it is, is they were, to a degree, willing to be the canary. But I think actually a lot of that has to do with the fact that the direction that the market was driven over there, they have different regulatory rules on what they are and are not allowed to use over there. And they've always been, within reason, just a little bit more strict than we have been in the United States. And so I think that part of the innovation and the development of these types of things came out of um, necessity, and they had to find alternative options. So honestly, I think that if your goal is education, um, either Logan or Xavier, 
They both live over there. They have lots of experience over there, and they could probably explain more of how the market was driven overseas. What I do know about what has occurred in the United States is basically as a company, our owner was a water treater, right? It's just what he did. He was a water treater before he owned WST. And so I think to a degree, he was kind of fascinated with the the technology was presented to him. He remembered he had those knee-jerk reactions from the original ODA, you know, brick technology. And so then, you know, via him changing his career path, starting WST and and coming in contact and being more of of a vendor, he was, this technology was brought before him. And honestly, I think it was just interesting to him. And so he said, okay, well, we already have these relationships in place. You know, how could we bring this to the U.S.? And he went out on a limb and he brought a few of us onto this team and he just kind of allowed us to do it. (laughs) You know, our, our only job was to solve problems. And if we could do it using filming technology, then we were allowed to do it that way. And so that's kind of how WST really got brought into the product line. It, it actually, we had it available to us um, a couple of years before my team actually was really started working on it um, because we needed, we needed the support team and staff to be able to, to go out and, and try and be successful with it. So that's kind of how we got a hold of it, if you will, um, was working with team overseas. But the, in the U S it's, They've actually, there are groups that have been looking at it for longer. The kicker is it's all privately owned. So it's, it's either Department of Energy or EPRI that's been working with the technology for, gosh, upwards of, of a decade now. And so the information exists in the United States. The research has been done in the United States. It's just not necessarily made public yet. And where teams like ours or um, some of the other U.S.-based vendors that have started trying to, you know, figure out formulations or come forward with the technology, it's been a little bit delayed. But I think it's coming down the pike more than people realize. I think that there's been so much success. I mean, there's been headaches in figuring out, you know, stumbling blocks along the way. But ultimately, there's been so much success not just overseas, but also here in the United States now that, that people have realized that it's it's really becoming much more of a go-to chemistry than a one-off, you know, nothing else is working, so why not chemistry? Yeah, I think that makes perfect sense. You know, and if you look at it, the states are just slow to respond. I mean, look at Legionella, look at water conservation, you know, all that stuff we're normally taking the lead from some other nation and then we're applying that here. So why should a means be any different? I think that's totally realistic. I think that, um, you know, my patriotic side says we should be allowed to functionally make choices and move forward and and make decisions for ourselves. But at the same time, sometimes that slows us up a little bit. Sometimes I think we hold ourselves back. So the last thing I think about filming means in general is that if you're interested in them, if you want to learn to use them or Honestly, if you're if you're a professional in the AWT or water treatment industry, filming technology, we can't say anymore it's coming. The reality of the situation is it's here. <laughs> and so the best thing you can do for yourself beyond obviously listen to the podcast, beyond um, go to technology conferences and and try and learn as much as possible from the professionals that are there is read. There's so much information that is published on use and application and how do they work and why do they work. IAPWS has um, whole technical guidance documents out there. I mean, it is it is an international collaboration for application of these types of, of technologies. And so if I could encourage you to do anything, it would be read, educate yourself. Some of the reading is not as, you know, titillating as others. However, you will learn something from all of it. It will enable you to speak a language that you need to be able to speak to be competitive and successful. So read, educate yourself. 
That is outstanding advice. You're never going to go wrong by having more knowledge about a particular topic. So, Meredith, there is so much more that we need to cover. Thank you so much for coming on. I don't want to take all of your time today, so I'm going to ask if you'll come back next week and we can talk about the specifics of each system that we as water treaters would run into. Sure. Well, Scaling Up Nation, stay tuned because next week we're going to talk about the systems that you are treating and maybe filming the means are an additional way or maybe even a better way. Maybe they solve a problem that you can't seem to solve right now. So tune in next week and we'll start talking about the specific systems.